Hi, my name is Shari Urkowitz. Thank you so much for being here. And this is a story about family. Shara, you're going to have to leave work, OK? My sister said when I picked up the phone. It was my intern year, the winter of 2016, and I was on call overnight in the ICU. Um, Dad is alive, my sister said next. He coded, in V-fib arrest. He's intubated right now. They're going to be sending him to the CCU, but he's still in the emergency room. I think he should go to the hospital, and I'm going to try to come out too. To this day, I'm amazed by my sister's presence of mind. She was an internal medicine intern at Stanford at the time, and I was doing my preliminary year of medicine in New Jersey, 50 miles away from where our parents lived. And so began the worst month of my life, when my sister and I did 16-hour shifts at my father's bedside rather than at our respective residency programs. There were a lot of numbers during that time. My dad coded for 12 minutes, got nine shocks, was on two pressors and three antibiotics, intubated for nine days, on continuous dialysis for two days, had liver enzyme numbers in the tens of thousands, required six units of blood, and was oriented times one for four weeks. He was in the CCU for three weeks. Our story ends well. My father completed acute inpatient rehab before returning home. He doesn't remember any of this. When we tell him about what happened, he says it sounds like a fantasy. He's back to teaching as a professor. He and my mother live together in the same home they have for the last 38 years. They are happy. We are lucky and so thankful for the medical care that he received. Shortly after he returned home, I moved across the country and began my PM&R residency at Stanford. Since then, I have seen many patients and their families after catastrophic illness or injury. I don't often share my own family's story. I am aware of the dangers of oversharing as a physician. Is it of therapeutic value for the listener or only cathartic for the speaker? Am I giving false hope? Do I transfer my own biases out of a sense of unfair familiarity? These questions are always on my mind. Yet the few times I have shared has had a profound impact on families. For example, there are certain types of family members I recognize. There's the person who works in healthcare and whose questions sometimes rub doctors the wrong way when they're perceived as dictating care. She's usually a good historian. She has a notebook filled with the latest lab values and culture results. She's nearly always at her family member's bedside. She's me. I remember speaking with a family member like this. It's funny, she told me. I feel like I come up with an idea about 24 hours ahead of the doctors, share it, and then they'll report back to me that they'll do it like it was their idea in the first place. That hit home for me. I was compelled to share my own experience. She and I talked about that fine balance between advocacy for a family member and attempting to influence house staff, especially when you're in healthcare and especially when you believe you're right. We both knew the euphemisms medical teams had for us, involved, anxious, unrealistic. But what I also strongly believe is that involved family members are often the ones who notice nuances in a patient's medical condition that can affect a plan. My father taught night classes for 30 years. Astonishingly, he retained this schedule in the CCU. While vented and sedated, he would be nearly unarousable in the morning and then become alert in the afternoon. The medical team would see him at 8 a.m., declare him too tired for extubation, but never come back to reassess. Then, in the late afternoon, he would wake up and become uncomfortable on the vent. The evening nurse would sedate him for comfort, repeating the cycle. We watched this for days. It ended when my mother walked up to the medical team in the afternoon, demanded they look at my dad, and decide if he was ready for extubation. 
He was. He did fine. I often wonder how many extra days he was intubated because of a quirk in his circadian rhythm that didn't fit with the team's workflow, and how many extra days it would have been if my mother hadn't spoken up, and how many times I unintentionally do this with my own patients, putting my convenience over their care. The biggest affront was when I perceived indifference. When you have a patient who is minimally conscious, tubes coming out of every orifice, sometimes it's hard to see him as a person. I did notice a difference in attitude when I began my PM&R residency. In rehab, we're somewhat more used to seeing a patient's potential. I was taking care of one patient who fit this description. During his hospital course, he had multiple bleeds from cerebral cavernous malformations. His most recent had left him hemiparetic, with seizures, with a facial palsy complicated by a corneal ulcer, and with a trach and J-tube. Then he had had a pulmonary embolism. He was 55. His daughter was at his bedside. She looked about my age. I recognized the look on her face. I thought about when I looked like that, which words and actions by doctors resonated with me. I tried to inspire the opposite of indifference. I said to her, I can't understand exactly what you're going through, but I went through something similar with my own father last year. I told her about the cardiac arrest and each day feeling like a setback as it brought a new complication. I felt like there were too many pieces that had to be put back together, I said. Like there were too many things that could go wrong and that we're always one step away from something we couldn't recover from. I couldn't picture there being an end to it. There were good days and bad days, I said, but there was progress. He went home. I wish I could promise the same for your father, but what I can promise is it's our job to put those pieces together and try as hard as we can to get him home. Over the next few weeks, the daughter and I spoke on a near daily basis. I with medical updates and recommendations, and she with questions and updates of her own. I never brought up my own family again, and she didn't ask. Yet I felt a trust and an understanding that I'm grateful to have established early on. One month later, her father went home. I found that once a patient is beyond the life or death phase of a serious injury and the acute questions are answered, the more philosophical and complicated ones arise. I've been asked how long recovery will take, if he or she will ever be the same, and what everyone's new life will look like. I once had the mother of a patient in his 30s with moderate brain injury from anoxia caused by a cardiac arrest triggered by a kidney infection ask me if it was her fault, if she had waited too long to seek medical help when he got a fever. Again, I felt familiarity, that guilt, those unanswerable questions. When my father first felt sick, I had told him to go to his primary care doctor. Would he have died at home if he had listened to me instead of my sister who had sent him to the ED? Or, as my sister was convinced, was the cardiac arrest her fault? Had she sent him to an emergency department that gave him an antibiotic that dropped his potassium and caused the arrest? And so I told her what I tell myself, how that guilt wasn't rational and how it wasn't deserved, and how the reason our family members are where they are now, recovering, was because we were there to help take care of them. I told her that when my father was in the hospital, all I wanted to hear was hear him nag me again. How scared I was when he only knew his name and nothing else. How I learned to hate orientation questions because they put his deficits into a glaring light and made him embarrassed of his mind. But also how he retained his personality and wisdom. How he could always make the staff laugh. How, after my mom got into a car accident, he promised her how the only thing that mattered was that she wasn't hurt. Let the rest go to money, he said, an old Yiddish saying. In this way, he was still able to take care of her. I also gave my patient's mother the stark numbers, that the odds of surviving an in-hospital cardiac arrest, period, are about one in two. Of these, 
one in three survive to hospital discharge. Our family members have already beaten the odds. At the beginning, I told her, I was just happy that my father was alive. It could have easily turned out differently. And now I'm happy that he's happy. He's spending a lot of time at home, just like her son is. I once asked my father if he was bored. He said, only people who have never been sick get bored. I thought it was worth repeating. She did too. As I go forward in physiatry, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for the privilege of being able to offer what I can in a way that is honest and born out of being at the bedside. I'm thankful that what I see reflected back is the power of strength, support, and love in a patient's road to recovery. Thank you.